everyone. We're really glad that you're here with us for Meeting the Moment, How U.S. Innovation Policy Can Accelerate a Cleaner, Stronger, and More Equitable Economy. Um, I'm Natasha Vidangos, Senior Director for Climate Innovation and Technology at the Environmental Defense Fund, and I'm very pleased to just get us kicked off started by passing the microphone over to Josh Free to begin the event. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Natasha. I'm Josh Freed, the Senior Vice President for Clean Energy at Third Way, and really appreciate the entire EDF team for their partnership and collaboration on this event. I'm excited to be here today, and I'm looking forward to hearing from our dynamic speakers on the valuable role innovation will play in helping us reach our climate targets while also advancing equity and inclusion and supporting economic growth. In the climate and energy space, you hear the word innovation thrown around a lot, but it's not always something that most citizens can contextualize or policymakers explain well to their constituents, which is why it's so critical we understand the value of innovation in moving us toward a clean energy economy while creating jobs for American workers in emerging industries across the country. The International Energy Agency predicts that by 2050, nearly half of emissions reductions will come from technologies that aren't on the market yet. Which means we need to rapidly accelerate the scale at which we develop, demonstrate, and deploy clean technologies that will reduce carbon pollution and support a thriving clean energy economy. It also means we need technological innovation across all sectors of the economy including sectors that are challenging to decarbonize, like steel and cement production, aviation, and heavy trucking. Now, this is clearly a daunting challenge, but our country is up to the task. And with the right policies in place, we can invest in climate innovation while prioritizing equity and racial justice, which will all go to help create hundreds of thousands of new jobs for all Americans. I am absolutely honored to welcome the 45th Lieutenant Governor of Wisconsin, Mandela Barnes, to join me in conversation about U.S. innovation policy. Now, Lieutenant Governor Barnes was elected in November 2018, and he's the first African-American to serve in this position in Wisconsin, and the second African-American to ever hold statewide office there. Lieutenant Governor Barnes is also a member of the New Deal Leader Network, a national network of rising state and local elected leaders, where he serves as the co-chair of New Deal Climate Change Policy Group. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Lieutenant Governor. We're, we know you've been very busy recently and continue to be so. And so we really appreciate your taking the time to chat with us about U.S. innovation policy during Climate Week. Yeah, absolutely, Josh. Thank you for having me. It's really good to see you again. It's been a while, even, even though the last time it was over Zoom, but uh, really, really happy to be here to participate in this kind of conversation with you one more time. Absolutely, and hopefully the next time we can do it in person in Wisconsin. Oh, fingers crossed, fingers <laughs> crossed. So you were appointed by uh, last year by Governor Evers to lead the governor's climate change task force to discuss ways Wisconsin can tackle climate change and give direction to the governor's goal of 100% carbon-free energy by 2050. What were some of the greatest takeaways you had from the report about how we can use public policy to foster clean energy innovation. Absolutely, and, and two quick things. I always got to make the make the correction. Everybody uh, defaults to Evers. It's uh, it's the hard E at the beginning. Uh, so <laughs> with Governor Evers, I mean that is uh, everybody says it. Even people here in the state. This is the problem <laughs> from being out of state too, right? <laughs> I mean, you get you get a pass. <laughs> it's the people who are here local who still say Evers. Um, I could go into that conversation a little bit deeper. <laughs> well, there's a guy on the Madison Common Council and his last name is Evers, right? <laughs> so, this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you're a student of history, I'm Edgar Evers. So it's easy to think Evers. But <laughs> I, and I, I would also like to add, too, I mean, one thing about the task force, 100% carbon free uh, by 2050, I always like to add or sooner because the moment is calling for it. Uh, but one thing uh, about the report and the public policy portion of it, I mean, we used a large scope of voices and stories to inform our work. We brought together a diverse group of people and organizations from farmers to tribal leaders to utility companies, public health experts, youth climate activists, labor unions, 
uh, you name it. Uh, this was all to set the stage in a comprehensive way to make sure that we covered as many aspects, as many areas of not just energy delivery, but also uh, energy and environmental policy impact. And with that being said, we were able to come up with a, uh, with, with a broad range of solutions, over 50 that span nine different sectors. This included transportation, agriculture, environment, clean economy, uh, resilience, and food systems. And this would allow us to take the bold action that we need to address climate change. But we probably wouldn't have had as broad a scope if we didn't bring together as many people as we were able to, members of the public, informing public policy. What a concept. <laughs> Yeah, it's absolutely. And you know, another part of this that I'm interested in when you talk about the public providing input on public policy is there's a report uh, of research compiled by uh, environmental entrepreneurs in the Clean Energy Trust that highlighted how small businesses drive Wisconsin's clean energy sector. I think last year it was 62% 60, of uh, the state's clean energy businesses employed fewer than 20 people. What sort of feedback did you hear specifically from small businesses with respect to expanding clean energy across the state? Well, that's the thing. Small business growth fuels the majority of our job growth in the state and across the country. And with that said, these are the economically sound decisions that small businesses are making, whether it is uh, for their own bottom line or whether, you know, it is because what the people are calling for. People want to spend their dollars responsibly, especially as uh, so much corporate irresponsibility uh, gets highlighted. People want to know that the money that they spend is going towards the right thing, is going towards a more sustainable future. And while undertaking you know, new initiatives can be a burden for small businesses, any new initiative can be a burden. When, you tr make, when you're making a transition, it's not always easy. Uh, but I can say what we've heard from folks uh, who've just gone ahead and done it it has been good on multiple fronts for them uh, to be able to save money, uh, to also be able to contribute uh, to combating climate change and also having customers who just feel really good about shopping with them, about spending money with them, about doing business with them. And as was said, small businesses drive Wisconsin's clean energy sector. In 2020, 69%, again, of our clean energy businesses employ fewer uh, than 20 people. And this is, the, this is the trend that we'll see at least continue into the future. Uh, but we have reasonable expectations that this trend will only increase in the coming years. Yeah, and, and you talk about this trend and, and also the, the goal of 100% clean by 2050 at the latest. We talk about it as, as fast and fair as possible to reach that, that goal of 100% clean or net zero. You know, and, and we think about this at the federal level, but, but states and localities are where the rubber actually hits the road. Are, are there recommendations or takeaways from the task force that you would recommend the federal government borrow and replicate so that we can move faster? Yeah, I would say there are so many different sectors where we can uh, where we can engage. And, you know, agriculture is one of them, especially here in a state like Wisconsin, where it is so important to our economy, so important uh, to the cultural fabric of our state. Uh, but I'll say that federal partners can learn from the works that not just Wisconsin, because you know, we were dormant in this space for eight years before we took office. Uh, in many ways, we took steps backwards. And there were many other states who were able to show climate, environmental leadership, responsibility, and stewardship. And you know, we were able to learn from those states. We were able to learn what worked, uh, what didn't work, and what had yet to be you know, attempted or tried. And again, I can go back to that diverse coalition to create the solutions that were specifically focused on Wisconsin. I know a lot of times uh, some of the slogans that get thrown out there, some of the things that people say, uh, give people a little bit of pause. And I think uh, regardless of you know, the approach, whether you want to be as, as bold as possible in talking about a just transition or you're going as far as you want to go uh, with a Green New Deal, for instance, the fact is we have to be state specific because the opportunities that exist in California and Florida are going to be much different in the Midwest. So there has to be that flexibility. There has to be that room to say, well, we're going to use the opportunities in whatever part of the state or whatever part of the country we possibly can. I know, uh, for instance, that 
even from a regional perspective, all the solutions uh, just in Wisconsin are going to be different depending on what you know, what corner of uh, the state you're in. Uh, you're near Lake Michigan, your opportunity is going to be a little bit different than if you're closer to the Mississippi River. If you're by Lake Superior, it's going to be a little bit different than it's going to be at the Wisconsin Illinois border. So, allowing that flexibility is probably the most important part uh, of the conversation that needs to be had because there can be real fear uh, amongst people uh, in, in different parts of the state uh, who are concerned about, you know, what. The transition is going to, what the transition is going to look like for them economically. Uh, you know, Wisconsin isn't a coal or oil state, so we don't have those things in the way. Uh, but there is a reality for people in Kentucky, in eastern Kentucky, people in West Virginia, uh, people in North Carolina and parts of Ohio. And one one thing we we should do is, I think it makes more sense for us to lead uh, with the transition piece. I think it makes sense for us to lead with the economic benefits. Uh, and then explain how, not just is this a benefit for the country, not just not is this just a benefit for the globe, uh, it's a benefit for individuals personally, being able uh, to be employed in safer industries, uh, industries that are uh, much better overall for a, for a person's individual health. And we have to look at the impact that climate change and also these extractive uh, and, and dangerous industries are, are, are having uh, on folks who are employing them. And there are many local municipalities, tribal communities, and organizations that already have solutions. And one thing we can look at is how the federal government can be a partner in scaling up versus reinventing the wheel. Yeah, no, that's it, it, that, that's really helpful. And it, it uh, brings it down to a more local level of thinking about these as issues that that individuals experience and then back up to the uh, more industri industry and, and sectoral and, and, and state level. Um, given that it is climate week and the UN General Assembly is meeting, um, you traveled as Lieutenant Governor last uh, time there was a COP that met in person to COP25 at a time when no, the US did not send any senior members of the Trump administration mm. to attend the conference. With, with COP26 around the corner, how can the US establish itself as a leader in, in climate innovation and clean energy technology? Yeah, that's a, that, that, that's a really important question. And I would say um, with that, I, I, I absolutely think that the case has already been made or the declaration has already been made uh, with President Biden, a person who understands that this is one of our greatest threats, one of our greatest challenges, a person uh, who has spoken boldly about the need for us to act. I think the leadership starts at the top and making that sort of declaration, getting back into the Paris Agreement were incredibly important steps. Uh, but now we have to be sure to deliver on that. And I think that over the course of the four years, uh, the last four years, uh, we lost a whole lot of credibility in this conversation. So much of it is regaining that, regaining the trust of our, um, of our global partners. And with that uh, being the reality, I think we sort of have to just lead by example. Uh, that means, uh, you know, not, that, that means joining the other countries, not just sitting idly by. Uh, the countries who have done the work over the last four years when we virtually have done nothing. And we have to also hold other powerful countries accountable, places like China, places like India, even the UK, because at COP25, it was seen as a disappointment for so many people because the largest nations uh, sort of fell short on their responsibility. And the big reason that was the case is because the United States fell short on our responsibility. Uh, it was almost as if we were there just to be there uh, with, very, with, a, with a very small footprint and, and, and a very real path and uh, no real plan to, to, to be the leader that we should be. And the other thing on the, uh, you know, to, to, to put a cap on this is the fact that we have to do as much as we possibly can to help smaller countries transition. Uh, especially as we are a leading contributor, we have to look at our smaller countries, our trade partners, uh, to display our collective power to make sure uh, that they aren't, you know, because of, uh, for economic reasons, making sure that they aren't 
uh, taking the route that leads to worse emissions that diminishes quality of life for folks because you know climate migration is real people are moving in droves all across the world because of climate related issues could be air quality could be water quality or water shortages and with our collective power as well uh, we have to also uh, maintain our commitment, our dedication uh, to helping states, letting know, letting all the subnationals know that they aren't on their own anymore. When we put out our task force report, this was with um, no expectation of any help from the federal government, not knowing what the November election was going to bring. We just wanted to talk about what we could do on our own in hopes that one day the federal government will come on board. And now uh, to have those uh, commitments from the Biden administration is gonna be incredibly helpful. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's very helpful context. We have time for one more question. And I think it's the last time we spoke, uh, you, know, you talked about building trust and the need to engage with communities. And you talked about how um, you had, how, how you experienced engaging different communities across the state of Wisconsin, given you've got urban areas, rural areas, Whole bunch of different levels of education and everything else can you talk a little bit about that to close out how do you engage the diversity of constituencies in the state and how do they respond when you talk about climate change so it just depends on where you are um i think we have to look at this in sort of uh we have to look at the economic perspective there are opportunities with our tech college systems that are offering certificate programs and solar and in wind uh, but, you know, this is the story I tell all the time about my dad. It's like nobody approached him with some climate change conversation or, you know, at that point, some global warming conversation. It was a job opportunity. Yeah. My dad, his degree is in elementary education, but he worked on an assembly line and he assembled catalytic converters. Uh, the reason vehicles had to have catalytic converters is because the EPA and the Clean Air Act required uh, lower emissions for vehicles. And the only way that was going to get down was with catalytic converters. Turns out somebody had to build those catalytic converters. And this is the same way, uh, like here uh, in Wisconsin and across the country with uh, renewable energy when it comes to solar, and when it comes to wind turbines. We have to build these in the United States of America. This is the conversation we have to have. When we're talking about job creation, uh, you know, people, the, the, the conversation about climate change specifically uh, isn't as relevant to folks who are, uh, who are just trying to put food on the table, people who are trying to earn a living. And that's one of the things people have been using on the other side of this conversation uh, to keep fossil fuel industries afloat. Uh, you know, what are we gonna do with the, you know, with the coal miners? What about people who are drilling for oil in the Gulf Coast? You know, they always lead with the job aspect of it. And we have to do the same because there's way more opportunities in job growth and job creation in renewable energy than in fossil fuels. Well, especially in a conversation about innovation, that is a great way to wrap it up today. Yep. Thank you again, Lieutenant Governor, for taking the time to speak with us today. Always, always a pleasure and always a fun conversation. I'm happy to pass it over now to Natasha, who's going to lead our next segment for the event. And we have a fantastic group of panelists prepared to speak, and I'm excited to hear from them. Thank you again, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you. And thank you, Josh. Um, so transitioning over to the panel, we've heard a lot of themes that I'd love to, to pull out there. Um, for those of us who really focus on federal policy as relates to innovation, you know, there's a clarity and there's a deep understanding across the field that we really need more of the tools in the box. A lot of net zero strategies that we're relying on are dealing with technologies that are not completely out of the gate. And so ensuring that we're fomenting innovation in a meaningful way is really, really critical. But how do you connect that federal policy, which can be rather abstract, it can be technical and wonky, it can be its own specialized language, how do you really connect that to people? So today's panel, we'd really like to dive into that question a little bit more deeply. Um, the transition to net zero economy is really, really going to require a complicated balancing act. We need, on one hand, dramatic decarbonization at an unprecedented rate. Uh, technological transitions that will impact all sectors of our economy from the hard to abate all the way to kitchen tables across the country. And while we do that, we have to ensure that we're creating a transition that provides good paying jobs and protects people's livelihoods while building the workforce of the future, recognizing and addressing the injustices that exist in the current system, and also creates a positive trajectory for all. We also know that the, the year, the year and a half of COVID-19 has wreaked havoc on R&D budgets and the prioritization of innovation, there's a lot of, a lot of turmoil 
um, out in the globe. And yet there's also a consummate opportunity in the form of all of the different legislation moving across the globe for stimulus, for healing, for moving forward. And that's very, very true here in the United States where some of the most consequential bills are being discussed and considered in Congress that would have enormous implications for innovation going forward. So one could really ask the question, if we're really talking about R&D and innovation, technological opportunities, that starts you know, at the sort of R&D state, but doesn't all of this, these questions about the human effect, the human impacts, inclusion, equity, deployment, doesn't that all live at the end of the pipeline? How could we possibly think about the implications of the technology at the end while we're talking about the development at the beginning? But one could also ask, how could we not? If innovation really is one of the greatest opportunities for us to solve problems collectively as a society and you know, meet the moment and reach the climate crisis where we can really find solutions, then that's something we're gonna to need to do together. So we have a lot of things ahead of us. We need to identify the most impactful opportunities to address the climate crisis through innovation. We need to empower our scientists, entre entrepreneurs and innovators creating systems that get technologies from R&D over the values of death to commercialization and deployment. We need to be flexible and tolerant of risks and dead ends. Uh, that's a fundamental aspect of innovation, no matter what. And we also need to work together to incorporate perspectives from different communities and stakeholders to define together the problems that need solving and how we can solve them. So this isn't a new problem. Innovation is happening across communities in the United States every day. Um, we have a lot to learn from one another, but we can also really move this forward. I'm delighted to have an excellent panel here today. You can find all of their bios in the main website for, the, for this event. I will not read them all in detail to save a little bit of time, but I'm pleased to welcome Chris Deschini, former congressman and board member of the National Intertribal Energy Council, Jason Walsh, the executive director of the Blue Green Alliance, and Jetta Wong, Senior Fellow at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, and also President of JLW Advising. So let's dive right in. I would love to start with some positive examples. Um, we heard already some interesting stories coming out of Wisconsin from Lieutenant Governor Barnes, um, especially for Jetta and Chris. Um, it can feel very abstract to talk about what it means to get innovation policy in a right, in a, get it right in a way that really delivers benefits for communities. Can you give examples of times when we really got it, where we did it right? What's it look like? Chris, do you wanna start? <laughs> sure. So um, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. Uh, Chris Deschini, member of the Navajo Nation. Uh, we would say yate do kehe kwaetsad bashaho agi bahe A lot of words for just saying, hey, thanks for the opportunity. Um, one thing that happened uh, for tribes uh, in, in the United States is the passage of the 2005 Energy Policy Act. That was the first time that the federal government looked at tribal uh, energy and tribal governments. From that, the Office of Indian Energy was created at DOE, where Jetta and I served under the Obama administration. And the, the positive examples keep coming out of that office, and those are the uh, programs and projects that were funded under the office. So to date, there have been over um, I think 180 uh, projects that have been funded in Indian country, as we call it, with uh, um, over $80 million invested for some total of $180 million um, uh, with tribal investment. So um, in, in addition to that, new innovation has created uh, up to 44 megawatts of new generation, those primarily on the renewable side. All told, that is a drop in a bucket to probably a lot of members on this audience. It's just so uh, embarrassingly small, um, given the vast potential that tribal uh, nations and uh, tribal lands have for the, for the uh, support of energy policies, including climate change and all that for Indian country. But the good news is it's every year more projects are being done and the federal government got it right by funding um, the Indian, uh, the Office of Indian Energy. Jetta. Well, I totally agree with you. And I think, first of all, I should say thank you to the Environmental Defense Fund and the Third Way and of course, Climate Week for putting this um, event together and, and including me in this conversation. Um, first, you know, 
Natasha, I think you got it right. A lot of people think about innovation and innovation policy as some really wonky conversation or some conversation about a whiz bang technology that's going on in a national laboratory when innovation can be something that is going on on the ground in communities and solving community problems, which is what Chris was just talking about and getting those megawatts, gigawatts going in, in those tribal communities. One policy that I think has been really successful that the federal government has supported, um, the Department of Energy has supported, Economic Development Administration has supported, are incubators and accelerators that work in communities across the country to really understand what are those problems that communities have? How do we bring technology and new startups and entrepreneurs to those problems? And so one example that I'm pretty lucky to be involved with, or in the past have been involved with, is the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. Um, they are an organization in LA that is grounded in the problems of LA. And just one example of that is the Transportation Electrification Partnership that they launched in 20, 2018, it was. And it was all about, is all about, I should say, understanding the community problems, understanding what the state can do, what the federal government can do to bring new technology to the transportation sector there in LA. They did community outreach, they did requests for information, and they brought together a whole group of state, local, private sector, nonprofit community members to launch pilot demonstrations with their startup companies, to bring new policy to the table, to encourage the federal government to do more in the transportation space. And over the last 10 years, LACI has been a very successful organization starting 200 or helping 281 startups, create, uh, creating more than 2,300 jobs um, and bringing more than $636 million to, those to the area. But they're not the only incubator in the country. We have incubators that are working on local problems all over the country. Bright Innovators is another one in Ohio that is looking at the fact that they have excellent manufacturing capabilities that have slowly deteriorated over time. How do they bring that back? How do they bring entrepreneurs into that manufacturing community? And how do they work with the, the labor community that is right there with them is trying to understand well, what, what are these new jobs that you're talking about with these entrepreneurs? So I think incubators are a great opportunity. Federal support is, uh, you know, it's been going on and we need more of it. Thank you. Great examples. And one of the, one of the areas that's receiving a lot of attention, especially in the bills that are being, that are under consideration in Congress right now, are relating especially to those larger projects, the demonstration projects, where, you know, very often they're at, they're at a larger scale, they're at a deeper level of development, a greater level of maturity, but there's still a lot to learn about how you actually deploy a technology on the ground. In a sense, you know, one of the themes that also Lieutenant Barnes raised, uh, Lieutenant Governor Barnes raised was that we need to think about solutions in states. The solution is always going to be somewhat specific to the place. So we need to think in terms of place-based solutions. And yet we have a, a innovation apparatus that sometimes has a bit of a national lens. So how can we do a better job of really ensuring that we're getting to place-based solutions? Um, it seems like demonstration projects are a great place where that, where that can start. Um, so, you know, what do you think of the bills that are moving through Congress right now? How can the federal government ensure that these funds that are going to projects as large as these have maximum positive impact for communities, such as in the form of good paying jobs and best impacts on the communities that are located nearby? Well, maybe I'll start a little bit on that one. Um, something that Natasha knows that I've been doing quite a bit of work on. Let me unpack that a little in that. Um, there's some amazing work going on in the Congress to support large-scale demonstrations. Um, this is a new office that the Congress is working on creating in the infrastructure package um, that would receive $21 billion over five years to demonstrate new technologies across the country. But as Natasha said, we need to make sure that those demonstrations are going on in communities that want them, that benefit from them, that understand the value of those technologies, and can participate in seeing those technologies actually demonstrated and deployed. 
And so with the establishment of this new office, I think it's coming at a really great time because this administration has also made environmental justice a very high priority. Some people probably know, and maybe Chris can talk about more, the Justice 40 initiative that President Biden launched, which is a whole a government approach to addressing our environmental justice issues. It's it's going to, it's requiring 40% of the benefits from clean energy investments, clean energy and climate investments to go to disadvantaged communities. And I'm really happy to see that it's already being implemented in funding opportunity announcements coming out of the Department of Energy. Uh, so you can, if you're looking for money from the federal government, you should know that they already put out guidance, the White House has already put out guidance, you should be aware of that and how these different programs are going to be asking for information about have you engaged with communities? What are the benefits that these new demonstration projects are going to bring to your community? Um, and there are lots of different ways that we can do that. And Chris, you probably have some ideas of some of the ownership opportunities with demonstration. I know that you've worked on that quite a bit. Sure, thank you, Jetta. Um, to, to the point of investments of dollars into Indian country, um, roughly 11 billion is being dedicated for tribal, um, tribal uh, infrastructure development, not necessarily energy or um, we're looking at water as well. Um, we're looking at um, up, up, um, improvements to facilities like hospitals and schools. Um, in the energy sector, I think there's an allocation of about 2.5 billion. If you do one transmission project, you're not even going to pay for that project. So the point here is, even though there are billions being allocated on demonstration projects, it's still not enough for tribes. Um, and what I think is part of the solution, um, in addition to this, and I think Congress misses the mark, and, and it's only, a, a, I think it's a function of education. Um, the group that I'm working with, the National Intertribal Energy Council, is working to create an organization that supports energy development, but um, in conjunction with partners like tribal, uh, professional tribal advisors, um, uh, folks like me who have been working in the industry for uh, years and decades. But the main key is addressing uh, the relationship with the energy and climate and environmental and all the sectors that are involved with this focus. And that is an industry partnership that takes these dollars that are coming from the feds to the next level. And through those partnerships, uh, arrangements, structuring, we have a lot of ways to create um, returns for tribal communities. And today, tribal um, professionals like myself are in place to support um, tribal development that um, eliminates the old models of uh, what I call the colony, mo colony models where um, they're just taking resources from the tribes. Now tribes are about equity, ownership. They want to direct, they want to be able to take resources to then support not only the programs, but also look at the larger uh, health and welfare of their communities. So um, good start on Congress. I still, they're miss I still think they're missing the point, but um, if we then just kind of open it up and industry comes um, with uh, uh, federal dollars and programs, one classic example, I'm gonna throw a plug for Jetta is her group, when we were there, they work with industry to create innovation and technology changes for tribal, excuse me, for the industry itself. My job was to kind of put the tribal hook to it and, and hopefully increase that. And one last point, um, tribes don't need to take energy in terms of the old model, right? We don't need to do the vertical integration, the, the horizontal kind of, the, you know, the power lines are the classic example that tribes now need to leapfrog and, and forget about the old utility model, but look at the new uh, distributive model tied to, say, microgrids and looking at new ways of supporting energy generation for the benefit of their communities. And um, I think uh, we need to fund those kinds of programs that kind of think ahead um, and adapt to the, the situations. Thank you. I saw Jetta had one follow on, and then after that, I'd love to hear from Jason about, about where this goes in terms of the jobs impacts. Well, thank you, Natasha, and thank you, Chris, for bringing up the Office of Technology Transitions at the Department of Energy. 
they have done a ton of work to do exactly what you're talking about. It's more about those partnerships um, in creating partnerships with communities, partnerships with industry, partnerships with labor, which I'm sure Jason is about to talk about. Um, and part of that, I think we often miss um, is it's not just about, okay, we're gonna take in information from communities and we're gonna make sure that they're engaged. We also need to be thinking about closing the wealth gap. We want to make sure that these new demonstration projects are going to potentially be owned by some of these communities. We need to be thinking about how are there different business models like Chris was just talking about. We're gonna do microgrids. Well, does that need to be owned by a big utility? Could that be owned by a community so we can make sure some of that wealth is getting back into that community? So those are other important things that we need to be thinking about and pension funds at local governments, pension funds at unions, you know, they can also be owning some of these projects. So I think that there's a lot of good opportunities here. So Jason, I know you want to talk probably about this a bit. Yeah, I'd love to, uh, <clears throat> but I, I didn't want to interrupt either of you because you had really important things to say. I mean, I would, you know, to your question, Natasha, about supportive federal policies, both Chris and Jetta gave great examples, but let's, let's just name the elephant in the room here, <laughs> right? Which is the examples that have already been provided uh, are, are within uh, legislation in Congress right now, uh, and we are in a make or break moment. Um, uh, we have the ability to pass climate forward, pro worker, pro community budget reconciliation legislation, um, but we got to get the votes. Uh, and the fate of that budget reconciliation legislation is very much tied to the fate of a bipartisan infrastructure bill uh, that was passed by the Senate uh, uh, over the summer. So I just I want to be very clear about that, particularly for the folks listening in who are who are you know in the U.S. Um, if you're not talking to your members of Congress about the importance of passing federal legislation, now's the time to do it because I'm not sure we're. We're going to have another opportunity like this in the near future to actually make historic levels of investment and new policy that meet not just our climate crisis, but also various other intersecting crises that we face as a country. And from a BGA perspective, none is more important than the crisis of historically high levels of income inequality that is very much grounded in systemic economic and racial injustice. Right. And so we have a chance as we're making these big investments in infrastructure, you know, water, clean energy, go on down the list, schools. If 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 we get the conditions right, right, if 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 we attach strong labor standards, uh, if if we uh, attach strong targeting consistent with Justice 40, we can actually make sure that the, the benefits of this <laughs> are widely shared, because let's be honest. Uh, in, in the last decade, uh, which has really been, you know, the, the 10 years in which renewable energy in this country has taken off, we haven't done a good enough job of that. Uh, not all of the jobs we've created are high quality. I would, I would add high quality union jobs. Uh, not all of them are accessible. We're not capturing the full value chain of those jobs. And, and from my perspective, that's the, 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 the missing piece in particular is manufacturing. Um, so we have the opportunity to do that. Um, at a, at, a, at a kind of lower level, just I think for the sake of this discussion, since we're talking about in, innovation, I, l let me just offer that I think we need to do a much better job of ensuring that what we uh, invent here, we build here, right? Um, and this gets back to my point about manufacturing. We at this point have a depressingly long list of examples of technologies that were developed via our in US funded R&D, often international labs, and then they're deployed, commercialized in other countries, right? Um, there are a whole bunch of reasons why that happens and a bunch of policies we got to consider as we, as we think about that. But certainly one of them is conditioning our R&D investments in much clear expectations about uh, recipients' plans or even commitments to commercialize that technology in this country in, in very concrete ways that, that workers and communities benefit. Um, I, I think when we it, it, you, we often miss a step when we're talking when we're talking about the the spectrum from R and D to deployment, right? It's actually a virtuous cycle, 
And in fact, I'd argue that some of the most important uh, innovation only comes from technology learning at the shop floor, right? When it's actually being made or deployed. And, and then if, if, you've got, if you've got the R&D link to that, then you, it, it, it goes around in a circle. Um, then let, let me make one more point. And this builds on something that, that a couple of other folks have said. Um, innovation meets, means change. <laughs> uh, it means changing conditions for workers. There've been a couple of references on this call to, to transition and, and to the term just transition. Um, uh, that's a term I, I like a lot. Uh, I've done a lot of work on it. Um, but we, we need to be clear that uh, there have been a, a series of very profound economic transitions in this country over the last several decades, none of which have been fair to workers <laughs> or to communities, I'd argue. And, and so, it, and, and that's largely because policymakers have failed to design an adequate policy response to those kind of changes. So as we make this shift, that's got to be a part of it. Thank you, Jason. Many great points. Jed, I think I saw you had one follow on. Uh, you're here to what Jason just said. I, it was whatever it was, it's fine. I'll go with the uh, US on. manufacturing. Absolutely. Absolutely. J Jason, since we're on the topic, um, would you like to talk a little bit more also about just US competitiveness? Obviously, a lot of countries are investing a great deal in new technologies. These things are becoming hot markets in many ways. How do we stack up? How do we do better? Uh, we can do a lot better. Um, and, and, and just starting from the principle, right, that we're, we are not going to rebuild prosperity uh, in, in this country if, if U.S. workers and communities don't reap the benefits of, of this kind of a transition. Um, I'll go back to the manufacturing example, and, and then I'd love to, I'd, I'd love to, to, to hear from my colleagues. Um, EVs, right? We're, we are in the middle of a profound transition in our automotive sector. It's gonna happen, <laughs> that, that's the one thing we know. But whether it happens in a way that benefits workers in this country and communities in this country is very much up in the air. And we are in a situation where some of our biggest competitors, China is one, but also the EU have made very, very strategic, intentional investments in building out their EV manufacturing supply chain. We have not done that. <laughs> And so we're lagging far, far behind. Um, we also haven't done a good enough job of, of actually maintaining job quality within the manufacturing sector. We have let that slide, particularly as we have let, because of very bad labor law, uh, union density within, within the manufacturing sector, all of our economic sector slide. So um, in order to be competitive in that sense, uh, in, in the EV, EV space, it's going to require policy. And again, we have a budget reconciliation bill that, that gives us an opportunity to do that and a series of actions the Biden administration is taking. I, I would also just say more broadly in, in the industrial space, U.S. manufacturers ha have to be better positioned to compete in what I think will probably be the most important global economic race of, of our lifetime, right? Which is selling clean technologies or selling any product made in cleaner ways to, to the rest of the world and domestically. And right now, at least in the industrial sector, which is what we're most focused on, all of the most cutting edge innovation for industrial decarbonization is being commercialized in other countries, not because their manufacturers are more innovative or their workers are more skilled, but because they, they have better, a better policy regime in place that, that actually supports that. I'd love actually to move on to that topic. Obviously, there are a number of sectors that are that are very hard to abate, hard to decarbonize. Um, industrial sector is a natural one that gets talked about. Cement, steel, manufacturing. Um, there are others as well. Innovation is very often considered a tool that really should be prioritized towards those areas because we may not have the solutions that we need right in front of us. Uh, appreciate your comments, Jason, about how we really need to get ahead of the game and make sure that those jobs stay here in the United States, that innovation you know, is happening here. I'm curious to know if, if others also feel that there are other policies that can help us do better in the hard to abate sectors in terms of innovation. If I may, um, this is Chris. So there's a lot there. I feel like I could teach a whole class all day on this, especially with the areas that I'm familiar with. Um, first off, regarding Indian country, Indian country is open for business. So folks need to turn back um, instead of looking, and no offense to the outside world, um, to the external buzz, but also look internally to their indigenous communities and say, look, 
there's a way to do this and, and get all the benefits that we're talking about here today. Uh, a lot of smart people out there and there's a lot of opportunity. So I would say Indian country in the United States at least is open for business. Um, in the hard to abate uh, sectors, a um, couple points. One thing that we're doing at, at the NITEC uh, Council is looking at possibilities of nexus industry. So water, agriculture, um, even housing. Um, and then there are what I call the four letter industries, right? So coal, oil, gas, and mining. Um, even in those areas, um, we are looking at um, supporting potentially, um, and I don't wanna speak for the whole board because I know the board is, is, is diverse, but there are opportunities to help clean, for example, mining operations in and around Indian country. Um, there are mining groups that are looking to change their production, their models, and support uh, better outcomes for tribal communities. The problem is that the education is not there on the tribal side, at least, for the understanding of new technologies, new uh, methodologies, new development, and, and renewable energy that would go, for example, and supplant um, generational needs for mining operations. Um, coupled with the new mining techniques, all of that is hard to explain, especially when you have indigenous communities that were just um, destroyed by decades of, uh, uh, of wrongful practice. I mean, I'm trying to say it the nicest way I could say it, but we do know that um, companies are coming to us. And an example, I like to think that we're trying to now do in the United States is, um, is happening in Chile with uh, the Mining uh, Cleaning Institute there. And we want to do something similar, not only with mining in, in Indian country, but also with tribal energy, like a tribal energy institute, looking at these types of entities that will help educate not only our tribes, but give industry the education they need on indigenous communities, but also support the, 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 the building of partnership between two groups and addresses the number one policy problem or the number one development issue in Indian country is finding capital for investment, whether it's pre-feasibility, feasibility, or the entire project itself. So a lot to say, like I said, I could probably give a class on this, but that'll be for another day. Thank you. Jenna, go for it. Well, so, you know, you were talking, Chris, about education, and it kind of reminded me of something else that is really important when we're thinking about innovation policy, is it's not just innovating in the world of like bringing a new technology to the market, or, or what is that new technology, the, the whiz bang stuff that we were talking about, but it's also trying to help and encourage policymakers in the federal government be more innovative and how they deploy those dollars. And so part of that, I think there's a really great program um, that the Department of Energy has run through their Solar Energy Technology Office. And it's all about education. It's their Soul Smart program. Uh, and what they do is it's a program run by the Interstate Renewable Energy Council. And the focus is on providing technical assistance uh, to communities that want to bring more solar energy installations into their community. But they don't know how, they don't have the technical expertise, they don't understand the permitting opportunities and how difficult it can, difficult it can be. So an innovative thing that the Department of Energies did was like create a labeling program, the Soul, Soul Smart Community, and provide them technical assistance and give them that branding so they know, just like Chris was saying, that Indian country is open for business, that these Soul Smart Communities are also open for business, that they've reduced the amount of time it takes to permit a new solar installation, uh, that they have increased the number of solar installations that they've done. There are 400 of these communities across the country. And with just $10 million that the Department of Energy invested in SolSmart, they've been able to leverage a billion dollars in solar energy installations. So we need to be more innovative in how we're thinking about the programs that we deploy in the federal government. And education is a great opportunity for that. How do we do that in a different way than what we've done in the past? Jason, do you have something to add? Yeah, but I think, Chris, did you, did you wanna jump in? Real quick, um, one example right now that's happening right now um, in Indian country, we 
pushed for uh, policy changes and made recommendations during our time at DOE. And one of them from Indian Energy was creating um, loan guarantee program for tribal energy development. Today, we have a program uh, that's uh, $2 billion strong under the loan guarantee program. Nobody has used it yet. And that's an issue because there are a number of initial issues at the beginning, including education on both sides, industry, the finance industry, and tribes themselves. Plus, there are there, what Jetta was just talking, this was my trigger, there are issues within the legislation itself that, and the rules that applying the loan guarantee program that are barriers for the tribes to use that loan guarantee program. And, um, you know, for example, the, the, the fees that are associated with processing the loan guarantee program, it, you know, they're, they're, they're very high with, with, with regards to these tribal projects. So that's something we can fix. And, but the education component is really just telling all the, the potential stakeholders that, hey, this is out there. We can use this to generate even more projects and development and solutions for our country. You're here. Um, so the, the, the hard to abate sector we, we focus most on is, is the industrial sector. Um, in full disclosure, our founding labor partner is the United Steel Workers Union, which, which represents workers in, in literally every energy intensive manufacturing subsector in this country. So iron and steel, cement, glass, uh, chemicals go on, go on down the list. Um, so uh, this is, the, the stakes here are really high <laughs> uh, for a bunch of reasons. Uh, manufacturing really matters in this country, right? Um, it, it, we, we can reel off the, the data about how, how many jobs it supports and how big a part of uh, GDP it is. It's also responsible for over half of private sector R&D in, in this country. And critically, from our standpoint, it, it is the, the, a, 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 an essential pathway to middle class jobs, although it has not always delivered on my promise, uh, particularly for workers without a four year college degree who have been on the hurting end of changes in our labor market and on the hurting end of just bad policy for, for, for several decades now. It is also the source of the fastest growing emissions globally, right? Um, and, and we can, again, cite more data here. We don't really need to do that, but we emit a lot of greenhouse gas emissions from our energy intensive manufacturing sectors. And then it also pollutes a lot of communities, <laughs> right? It, 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 and, it, and it disproportionately pollutes low-income communities and communities of color. So we've got, we, we've got a bunch of things here we need to like address and fix. We think the way we do that is, is to really use this moment to, to literally transform our industrial sector, right? To, 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 to make sure that it, is, that, that it is producing things in cleaner ways and not just from a greenhouse gas emission standpoint, but from a co-pollutants toxins standpoint, making sure that we're not doing, you know, that we're addressing disproportionate impact uh, and, and the full range of, of pollutants, but then also, you know, m making those manufacturers more competitive and ensuring that as, as they get the public investments they need to make these changes, that, that they are supporting and creating high quality, inclusive jobs that are accessible to all Americans, particularly folks who live in the communities where these manufacturers actually exist. Um, so that, that's the hard to abate sector that, that we're really focused on. And I, I think the stakes are really high. Thank you. That's a great point. As we're getting close to the end of the session, I want to make sure we get a question or two from the audience. I have one here specifically uh, steered towards Chris um, on the tribal innovation and energy development. Since first receiving funding in 2017, the Tribal Energy Loan Guarantee Program has struggled to aid tribes in their energy development goals. Um, what changes to this program could be made to better support tribal energy development and what other financial tools and federal funding or assistance could help tribes decarbonize and provide inexpensive energy to their constituents? So a couple of things. Um, one of the biggest problems uh, tribes face in starting a project is getting the dollars to do the pre-feasibility. So some tribes require, and, and if you don't know Indian country, um, there's a third layer that tribes have to deal with and that's the bureaucracy tied to being uh, within the United States. So there's separate laws that deal with the development of projects on tribal lands. Uh, leases are affected, easements, and then there's the whole NEPA issue tied to 
um, uh, tribal uh, projects. Uh, notwithstanding that, if you can get dollars to support the uh, studies that, um, whether it's a, it's a financial study, it's a due diligence, it's a pro forma, and or the numerous types of archeological, uh, environmental, cultural, all those issues, those tend to add up. In some cases, even moderate projects, say on the order of $10 million, $5 million or so, you could rack up, you know, just to start the project, you need uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars and or, uh, you know, a million dollar or two to, to get it going. Tribes don't have that necessarily. Um, plus you have the education capacity component, which in DOE does have a TA program as well, technical assistance. Um, in the legislation itself, at DOE, they have a Section 17 requirement, uh, excuse me, uh, I think they call it se Section 17, which is the requirement for new innovation uh, uses on loan guarantee programs. Congress created a carve out, this $2 billion that doesn't need that requirement. So you would think that we could plow ahead with projects. Um, still a barrier because the same basic requirements under the 17 program applies to the tribal loan guarantee program, which are the, the first step, I, I, you know, I'm not particular about, but the first phase requirements, you know, the initial study, the, the payment of uh, fees that require, that deal requires, um, and, and, and then there's uh, initial fees that are required. Um, the other problem is there's this disconnect between the tribes and the financial institutions, meaning the tribes have to come um, with their bank per se, and tribes are going to DOE, but the DOE is saying, no, you need to come with your financial institution. So there's a, there's a breakdown in communication there. Um, and so part of my job is to really kind of identify these, explain them, um, and hopefully kick some of these obstacles out of the way so that we can continue development. But um, the last thing I will say, in other programs at DOE, um, there is this problem with the matching requirement. At DOE for tribal energy programs, it's a 50% match. So if you're applying for a million dollars, you got to put as a tribe $500,000 down to get funding from DOE. That is a problem. Other programs in the federal government have 10% or even 0% matching requirement, but DOE somehow has still for its programs, this 50% matching requirement, which kills a lot of projects, I think. Thank you so much. And we are actually practically at time. Um, I was writing notes to myself here of all of the things that I wanted to summarize. And I found that I was basically writing every word all of you said. So it won't do very well with the summary, but um, a couple just freight, you know, a couple things that have been said that I think are really, really valuable to end on. Um, we can do better. We need to do better for workers, for communities. There's an enormous opportunity. This may well be the break, make or break moment in terms of the bills moving through Congress right now. So if these are topics that you care about, now is a moment to get involved. Um, there are great examples out there of this working well. We should learn from them. The learning should go both ways. Uh, we should do better in terms of technical assistance and ensuring that there's a greater understanding of how this process works. But there's also a lot to be learned by federal policymakers about what it really means to do innovation and to be innovative across the board. We can also be innovative not only in how we develop technologies and the technologies that we are directly developing, but also in how we get there and how we use policy to get us there as well. Um, innovation does mean change. Uh, and we can do a better job than we've done before at navigating these periods of change in a way that really works for all. So I wanna take a moment to thank you all on the panel. Thanks to everybody who's tuning in. We really appreciate you being here. This event will be recorded and I believe it will be shared um, and best wishes, stay well. <laughs>